Okay. Thank you so much, Katie. Whenever I take on a massive project, I want to make sure the artist's work conveys heart, breadth, and moral ambition. For those who think of Roger Winter in terms of a specific style or subject matter, we're going to show a range of images that give a much wider lens to the forces that have shaped him over the decades. This discussion is also about what it takes to be an artist over a lifetime, not just a career move. The highs and lows, the periods of trust yourself, doubt yourself, and what it also takes to be a genuine educator and mentor. I've always maintained that Texas will never be considered a major art center until our artists and history have been honored and documented. We're doing that today by bringing the focus back to the artist himself, his voice, his stories. But first I want to give a brief introduction about Roger and how far this journey has taken him. Roger Lee Winter was born on August 17, 1934 the youngest of five boys and three girls in a white frame house on a red dirt road that ran parallel to the Kansas, Missouri, Texas railroad tracks on the outskirts of Denison, Texas. Winner's father was a laborer in Denison in a Denison creosote plant that preserved cross ties and utility posts for the Katy Railroad. His mother cooked, washed, raised chickens and cows and worked in the garden with very little help and money. Their water came from a well dug and walled by his father. It was the only source for drinking, cooking, and bathing. They had no indoor plumbing. A two-hole outhouse stood at the back of their acre of land, all of them bathed in wash tubs that hung when not in use on the sides of their four-room house. For winter, Art has been a way to sort through the cross currents of his life. Race, class, family, as well as integrate all the pieces of himself into something whole. At the core of Winter's paintings is a spiritual search that plums the depths of the human condition. Roger Winter is an artist of searingly original visions that combine formal rigor and spiritual mystery. Time's passage, the preciousness of the natural world, the beauty of mundane things are all hallmarks of his work. The philosophical questions that emerge from his paintings, drawings, collages, and sculptures deal with our identity and existence, our solitary state in the world, our limits in space and time. Winter's art explores the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, our families, our country, and the porous, the porous border between history and myth. Throughout his staggeringly productive career, Winter has never adhered to a signature style. All of his work manifests a sense of place and direct experience, Texas, Maine, New York, New Mexico, Iceland, but also a sharpened sense of interior worlds, richly layered and nuanced. For over a half century, winter has gone various directions with skill. It, it, it's not a question of inconsistency, but openness and growth. At 84 years, he is not afraid of change or to push the limits. There is a recognizable tension in his paintings between the priority of structure and the boisterous claims of the world, a tension as old as realism itself. For Winter, stories serve to unify and engage rather than divide or marginalize. Like a writer or a musician, Winter has developed an ability to be in the moment while standing apart as an observer, a novelist's eye and singer's ear for detail, a precise 
but elastic voice capable of moving easily between the lyrical, the vernacular, and the profound. Winter has always been an artist of tenacity, deeply conscious of the traditions he works in and the references to other artists that it entails. Cycladic sculpture, Egyptian Fayum portraits, Roman frescoes, Netherlandish miniatures, the paintings of Bruegel, Vermeer, Poussin, Corot, and Vuillard, as well as 20th century artists who form the core of an American spirit. Edward Hopper, Stuart Davis, Romare Bearden. Closer to home, Winter often cites the preeminent Texas artist Tom Lee in helping him see a place and make the Southwest visible by painting it into existence. His development has been nothing if not eclectic. At different points over the decades, Winter's work has been inflected by cubism, surrealism, magic realism, pop, constructivism, primitivism, realism, precisionism, hard edge, and other idioms, all of which he combines and recombines in all sorts of ways. Surveying his life and art, we may wonder then, who is Roger Winter? Well, he is among the very few who have consistently pushed boundaries in an ongoing quest for self-discovery. It's impossible to account for the past half century without including Winter in the picture. Winter is the vital link between generations of Texas artists. His mentors and teachers as an undergraduate student during 1952 to 1956 at the University of Texas include Robert McDonald Graham, Constance Forsyth, Lauren Mosley, William Lester, and Everett Spruce. At the Dallas Museum School, he became an important mentor to a young Stephen Mueller, whose buoyant mystical paintings would later redefine New York abstraction. As an esteemed faculty member of Southern Methodist University between 1963 and 1989, Winter's past students include nationally recognized artists John Alexander, Julian Schnabel, David Bates, Robert Yarber, Tracy Harris, Gail Norfleet, Lillian Garcia Roy, and Brian Cobble, among many, many others. Over the decades, Winter's work has been regularly shown in prominent galleries across the country, in addition to major solo exhibitions organized by the Portland Contemporary Art Museum in Maine and the Meadows Museum at SMU, he has taught painting and drawing at the National Academy of Design in New York City and served as visiting artist at the Vermont Studio Center, the University of Pennsylvania, and Washington University. He received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship Award in painting and was honored with a Legend Award for contribution to the visual arts in Texas. Significantly, Winter authored four editions of the definitive publication On Drawing, which is widely used in university art departments. And I'm going to add, in May 2020, Roger is going to have a major exhibition at the prestigious National Arts Club in New York City. The art world has always laid claim to its share of mavericks, including those who pose as such. Genuine originals, however, people who follow their own lights, make their own rules, and create their own frame of reference are rare in this context as any other. Winter has never sought the avenues which measure success by sales, publicity, or branding. Throughout, he resisted categorization art world expectations, and almost any kind of authority. Winter's story is of an artist doing his own thing come hell or high water. It helps to think of him as a kind of philosopher carpenter with an inborn, almost mystical love of paint as paint. 
He wants us to understand its sensuousness while also grasping that paintings are essentially built from scores of decisions and details. Winner's path does not move in a simple arc, but meanders between his interior life and his life out in the world, connecting dreams, reflect, reflections, and memories. I am struck by a fundamental and counterintuitive generosity in his work. Winner's art is like a hymn to us, visual hymns of passage, of solitude and connection. They project a sense of sureness and passionate serenity that leads me to consider him as having moved into the first rank among living painters. Winter still trains his eye on the work directly in front of him. Every day, without fail, he continues to put brush to canvas with such single-minded focus that he doesn't even see his own career arc. Winner's story keeps going. His imagination is outsized and full of hijinks. He aspires to something new and challenging at every turn, a perpetual movement forward with propulsive, joyous energy. Roger Winter, Fire and Ice, forthcoming from Texas A&M University Press, is the first major publication to examine Winter's art in a critical context, its prodigious breadth and great wingspan. It presents Winter as a complicated, relentlessly rethinking experimenter, an artist who combines brain and hand in ways that other artists still have everything to learn from. A main theme to emerge is a profound understanding of human loneliness. Just beneath the confident paint handling and luminous hues are the insecurities of an isolated boy growing up by the railroad tracks in Denison. Poor conditions, which gave his art depth and dimension. The book provides a gripping account of Winter's artistic roots, deftly mapping early influences and the discovery of his own voice, unguarded, open-hearted, profuse. The title of the monograph and this discussion brings to mind Robert Frost's famous poem, which hints at the equally destructive powers of love and hate, ending in, abrupt, in an abrupt reversal of competing energies. Winter also seeks to hold such forces in dialectical tension, a push-pull of potential opposites. He puts essential truths before us, the brevity and the immensity of life. Winter's realism butts up against his romanticism, even as the ex existentialist in him has searched for ways to coexist with the artist. His work is half fire, half ice. So I'm going to give you Roger Winter, and he's going to uh, say a few things about just the beginnings of his work and his mentors, and then we're going to get on to a lot of different images here. <laughs> you have to pick it up. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to. Thanks to you, <laughs> Susie. I had no idea I was that get good. Close, get it close but, to you. What? Pick it up closer. Closer? Can yep. you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me now? <laughs> in case you didn't recognize me in this photograph, I'm the one that's not wearing a cutaway. <laughs> <laughs> um, always underdressed. <laughs> but um, I wanted to thank Susie and Cassetta and whoever else might be responsible for our being here today and for all the um, very pains, painstaking work that Susie's done over a long period of time for this book. Uh -huh. And I hope each of you in here will go out and buy a copy. <laughs> <laughs> that was only a joke. I'm not, I'm, 
I'm not, I'm not a salesman. <laughs> but um, um, this is the first time I've been in Austin in some years. And um, I want to mention that in 1952, um, not having any idea of what college was, because none of my older siblings or parents or anyone had gone, I packed a very cheap suitcase and got out on Highway 75 and hitchhiked to Austin, Texas and enrolled in the University of Texas, which was at that time for uh, residents $25 a semester. <laughs> and uh, I think that was pretty good. I, it's probably gone up since then. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I didn't, the first semester was a terrible tragedy. I got kicked out of the first room I rented because I called the landlady's dog a, a bad word and I fired from the first job because I thought fraternity rush week was more important than ha having money. <laughs> but anyway, I, did, I thought art was something that had been done in, in Europe. I've said this before, I thought that was something done in Europe many, many years ago, uh, and that all artists were dead. <laughs> and I had an epiphany moment the first semester because a friend of mine took me over to the art building, which was a um, barracks building on Waller Creek? Waller Creek. Oh, Waller Creek on the campus, and um, showed me, I had drawn since, according to my siblings, since pre-memory. <laughs> Um, I, didn't, I didn't know there was an art department, and on the walls of the old barracks building, the hallway of the old barracks building, there was student work all around, drawings from life drawing classes, paintings, um, three-dimensional works, sculptures, ceramics, printmaking, uh, the uh, graphic design work, and it was just really, a, revel, a revelation, and, a, and for me a revolution, I just uh, decided this is what I want to do, this is what I want to be, and I've never looked back, I've never wanted to look back. And, it was, and the people that I met there, that Susan mentioned, Everett Spruce, William Lester, um, Constance Forsyth, um, Lauren Mosley, Robert McDonald Graham, who wasn't from Texas, were like, I, I wrote something about them in this cat. I, I did a show for a Kirk Hopper gallery in Dallas. Kirk was generous enough to do this, called A Transfer of Spirit. It has more than 40 of my former students in it from one place or another. And I just wanted to read a paragraph in my introduction to it. Whoops. <laughs> Got to be careful with this thing. My ambition to teach was developed through emulation of the University of Texas painting professors. All were well-educated, well-traveled, and filled with intellectual curiosity about the world. I, I now see them as my true parents. They gave a direction and substance to my life and to the lives of so many other students. It's not irrelevant that in time I came to see their paintings as somewhat provincial. If art students never surpass the works of their teachers, then art becomes either static or an endless downward spiral. What is more relevant is that those artists slash teachers found it in themselves to encourage youthful efforts and to give each student some inkling of what his or her talents were. I know they started me on the road to my life's work. I very much wanted to be like them. I wanted to be an artist slash teacher. Um, that's called Enter Urban, that painting is, and it's, I'm that face in the sky as a 10 year old and my wife Jeanette is uh, the girl standing underneath it when she was 10. And everything is out of scale, and that's the way it just really had to be. I had started drawing from life, painting from life, occasionally making up a, a, a figurative composition, but I, I really knew nothing about collage or montage or 
not that these are collage, but they're like collage. They're like things brought together. I've often said if you took, like this is a, the first of two family, um, family portraits that I did of, of most of my current family. One of our sons wasn't born when I did this painting. But uh, I've said if you took the edges away from this painting, the painting would scatter over oh, at least 50 years and several thousand square miles, no doubt. And some of it wouldn't know where to go because it was invented. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was like putting together all the things that were important for me. And this kind of, this sort of grew out of working at the Dallas Museum of Contemporary Art and getting to know, well, for one thing, Douglas McAggie, who was the dire director of the Contemporary, had a show, the first major show of Rene Magritte's paintings in the United States. And, um, wow, <laughs> we're going fast here, folks. <laughs> and that's a, a montage I did for a show that Douglas McAggie did several years after the museum had closed, and it's called the One Eye at a Time show. And uh, that was a collage, I think, about oh, 20 by 40 and 30 inches or something like that that I did of each person who was in that exhibition. I'm the person up in the upper left who's holding a lamb. Jim Love is the person with the elephant suit on or putting it on down in the lower left. Jim Love was a Houston sculptor that some of you knew well, I'm sure. David McManaway is the blind man with the box of uh, unidentifiable things from here. Bill Commodore is standing in the middle holding a, a bag and some, I think, some matzo meal. Uh, the, the sort of donut bagel shaped thing is, is a, sculptor by, uh, a sculpture by Charles Williams the Fort Worth-based sculptor who had passed before this show happened. And Roy Fridge is underneath it, who was a filmmaker, sculptor, um, very multi-talented man. And on the right side was Herb Rogala, who has on the uniform of Sergeant York. I think Herb was a little more disciplined than the rest of us were. I'm going to add right here it's important to understand that Roger is the only surviving artist from this entire group. And it's very special that he's here and he can tell us what it was like. He was there during this vital period. What he's talking about is truly the only avant-garde period in Dallas at the time. If you can imagine Douglas McHaggie and these uh, incredibly powerful and, uh, shows of surprising visual and often poetic juxtapositions, uh, Roger often talks about this period, how everyone lived in kind of an exotic poverty, all right? Nobody was really looking over their shoulders at the time, all right? It wasn't this big, glossy art world. Things were bursting forward. And Roger uh, worked with Klaus Oldenburg, who came in and did one of the very first happenings uh, at, the, at the Dallas Museum of Contemporary Arts. Roger, could you speak well, about sure. what it was like at that period? Well, sure. In, 1960, in 1962, uh, Douglas McAggie did a show called 1961, and it was the pop artist, you know, Andy War. There was an Andy Warhol. There was a Roy Lich Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein, as you prefer. Um, there was uh, Klaus Oldenburg, who brought his Plaster of Paris store there um, with just Plaster of Paris common objects, a uh, Pepsi lid, um, a slice of coconut pie sitting on a chair, which a, a Fort Worth artist that uh, I didn't know well, his name was Bror Utter, was so angry by the show that he picked up the Placer Paris chicken wire enamel 
burl up slice of pie and took a bite out of it. <laughs> and, uh, they used to have hard liquor at openings. <laughs> Just white wine these days, so you don't stain the floor. Um, but uh, Klaus Oldenburg was kind of confused about what he should do because that belonged to someone and it had been borrowed for the civil. So, and Douglas McAggie asked, uh, he asked um, Douglas McAggie, what should I do about this? And Douglas said, can you repair it? <laughs> and Klaus Oldenburg said, yes. And he said, then repair it and let's not talk about it again. <laughs> well, that was a long time ago and I'm talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> also, I, maybe talk about a little bit about engine that would happen there. The, the first happening, that I, real happening that I ever saw was called I-N-J-U-N, as in Indian that Klaus Oldenburg did in a sort of a frame house that was near the Contemporary Museum. And each room had some other, one or another, very weird things going on in it. And we were all holding on to a rope going through the um, rooms. And I heard a man say to the woman he was with in front of us, the DMA's membership's really gonna go up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just something that maybe Dallas in general or maybe any, any city wouldn't have been quite ready for at that time outside of New York. But um, the art, we were ready for it. The artists were ready for it. And, and I, I, think it, I think it really, um, uh, all of you together, uh, before Charles William passed, McManaway, Fridge, Love, that entire group, you really uh, gleaned much from their sensibilities. You had oh, a I shared did. sensibility going on they were each, that, uh, that, that really uh, came forward in your work. They were each, uh, one of them, uh, born in 1927, so David McManaway, Roy Fridge, Tim Love were each seven years older than I was, and I really looked up to them, and I learned from them, and I learned about putting things together that don't belong together. And um, I'll, in a little bit, I'll, I'll, I wanted to read another paragraph from another show that I just recently curated for, um, um, Kirk Hopper Gallery in Dallas called one plus one equals three, which was an expression David McManaway liked to use. Um, and it's about putting two realities together, or th three realities together, and what happens when you do that. Uh, um, Max Ernst uh, said that there was a, sp when that happened, there was a spark of poetry that leaped across the realities. and. And that was what uh, gave collage, montage, assemblage its magic. And then getting back to your work, Roger, like three boys uh, in using cut paper, um, how you were developing your brush stroke, but also, um, you know, throughout an artist's career, there are ups and downs. There are periods when you lose your way and what you were trying to achieve throughout the 70s, I think, if I'm correct, you were heading, as especially in Highlander Band, towards a unified space and time. That's, could you turn it back one? Sure. I just want, that's made from painted and cut paper, and it was imitating the, br the brush stroke that I was finding that, that was like a secondary language. Uh, if you wanted to consider the subject a primary language, then the, the relationship of the brush strokes was a secondary language. And uh, it was in a faculty show at SMU, and Brian Cobble was mentioned earlier. And Brian was an uh, assistant teacher of a class, and one of the uh, students in the class said to Brian, it would drive me crazy to do something like that. <laughs> And Brian said, have you ever met Roger? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's, that's good. And then going to the Highlander Band, uh, I, I'm sure all of you in the Dallas area have seen something similar out there uh, of just a, a mass of legs. 
and marching back and forth. But at uh, what, what looks like a commonplace scene, Roger was really looking for a way to unify space and time. I was looking for a way to get rid of uh, me, of personality, of person in work. I found out through constructivists that some artists had already been able to eliminate the Van Gogh that was in them and just work mentally. And I didn't want, oh, that No, looked, we're gonna go. Okay, yeah. that's um, Carolyn Horchauer. Um, and it's, the painting is six by eight inches. And I have to say, I think of it as one of the most monumental paintings I've ever done. And that's the size of it. And I, I don't know, I, I'm still happy with it. It was done in the late 1970s. And I still think the relationships of the marks, the brushwork, the overall composition of it, I'm happy with everything about it. And it's about hand size. It's a very small painting. Um, well, the size is on the, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about this a little bit. This, this is a study, but the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas owns the, the, the major painting that is 10 by 20 feet um, and commissioned Roger at the time. And we think it's probably one of the largest commissioned paintings for a Texas artist. It happens at present to greet all of the thousands of employees as soon as they get off the elevator at the Federal Reserve. And it's truly like walking into the landscape. When I say Roger uh, conveys a sense of place. This is uh, really about the Green Hills Conservancy, right? Yes, yes. And, and maybe talk about the, the hoisting of this and what it took to uh, just produce something of this scale and control your brush strokes. Well, I built, a, I built a, a pulley system on my studio wall, which was about 12, 12 or 14 feet high, and had to rent scaffolding and a, a contractor, a building contractor I knew had to rent it for me because they don't rent those to amateurs because amateurs <laughs> fall off of them too often <laughs> and sue the company. And uh, I got, I really developed my climbing muscles because I, I would have to climb up and down on a, uh, to the scaffolding boards quite often and back up and see what I had done and go back and try to repair it. And, but it was a good challenge working on 10 by 20 feet. There are people like James Searles, who, is, who will be giving a talk a little later, are accustomed to working that size, or working on sculptures that size. But 10 by 20 foot painting, I had to hire someone to build the stretchers. I had two people helping me stretch the canvas so that it would be taut and I primed it three coats, and you know, I've painted a lot of walls, as I'm sure many of us have, and uh, I, I, didn't, I knew how to do that, but it was something priming a canvas that size after just making one six by eight inches. <laughs> and uh, I think of it as a very, very good experience and uh, thankful to the Federal Reserve. And I think for, it's important too, Roger had emphasized when we were doing the book, that how important it was that he touched, his hand touched every centimeter of this painting. Yes. So, um, and at the same time, he was going, started going back and forth to New York um, and did a series of these paintings and they, keep, they get larger in scale as we go along. But again, that uh, luminous uh, quality almost like a, a, a dragonfly zooming across the surface and that wonderful poetic shimmer. Um, here's one of Sail Central Park, uh, Park Slope. Remember, uh, Roger is very conscious of art history, all right? We can go back to Isabel Bishop. We can go back to Reginald Marsh. A, a lot of the early painters and had similar scenes. Um, this, but if you look at this again, this image, it is a complex interweaving of wires and clothes and bricks and the spatial layering to get your eye moving back and back in space. The painting is like an, the painting is like an accumulation of 
um, thinking about the brush, the accumulation of, of a thousand abstractions. And, uh, and that one is an accumulation of several thousand this abstractions. Is, um, <laughs> we're going to switch gears a little bit here. As I said, uh, artists go through joyous periods, they go through painful periods. Roger and, and Jeanette decided to move to Maine in the late 80s. Um, this painting was one of the first uh, before actually moving there called Apple Trees. And it, was, it really represented the hope of a new place. These are Wolf River apples. And again, uh, looking all of those thousands and thousands of tiny detailed brush marks, the apples bob and dip and get your eye moving across the canvas. Uh, it was something of a, a, a just beauty and hope, but it didn't last long uh, for Roger, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, uh, he was also going back and forth to New York City. This is Union Square, and I look at it as a, a kind of a combination of languages. The actual written, printed visual language, a language of geometric structure, and uh, the language of his brush stroke. And again, if you can look at the just such detail, and Roger said, when I asked him, where did this come from? And he said he, he looked at Red Groom's painting, Chance Encounter at 3 a.m., which was a conversation between Mark Rothko and Willem de Kooning. And he wanted something of that scale. So um, if you want to comment on this briefly before we get into the main works. Well, I wanted to comment that Union Square has evolved like we have over the years, and it used to be a sort of a political meeting place while the Communist Party was important in New York City, so I'm told. And before that, it was a, it was a very fine s section of New York, and then it became sort of like a gathering place with uh, a market, a uh, vegetable fruit market, and um, Grace Gluck, is that her name? Gl Gluck, Gluck, uh -huh. Gluck mm -hmm. wrote about it once that it captures all the tardiness, not tardiness, tackiness. That's the what tackiness. I tackiness. Uh, I don't see how Union Square could be tardy. <laughs> <laughs> all, all the tackiness of, of Union Square during a time of transition. We, I want to go into the main uh, paintings. Uh, at, at this time, we need to understand Roger was in his mature period. Uh, he was represented by the very prestigious Fishback Gallery in New York, selling out shows. And then he and Jeanette moved to Maine. And he started doing completely different paintings. And Fishback couldn't understand what he was doing, all right, and dropped him. All right, the other thing was that Roger had left SMU, he had left Dallas, all his system of support, and they were out there in Maine, extremely cold we weather conditions. Um, he had become part of a, a, a group, a community of artists, Neil Welliver, Alex Katz, Lois Dodd, but he was in the studio. It was solitary. It was alone, and Roger told me um, that he went into a, a depression uh, and almost had practically a religious conversion. So these paintings, Winter Solstice was the very first of the series and the one that really set fish back on its ear, um, and an entire series. I, I'm, I'm talking about these because so oftentimes, the most powerful art emerges from extremely painful circumstances. And I think this is one of those examples. So Roger, if you want to start talking about these. I just these. wanted to say, I had a phone call from Fishback Gallery and said, and said we don't understand that last, that last painting you sent us. 
It wasn't that one, it was the one with the angel in it. And I said, oh, knowing exactly what they were getting, going to be getting at. <laughs> but they said, well, we noticed the fox is throwing a shadow, but the angel isn't. And I said, maybe angels don't throw shadows. And uh, like that, knowing it was, <laughs> knowing that I wasn't going to get anywhere with this. And that looks like an awfully big bird in the painting. And, and I said, well, maybe it's one of those big birds. You know? <laughs> I was also pressing Roger, like, where did this come from? And I kept at him. I said, there's something else going on here. Um, I mean, in a way, if you remember those very first paintings in the 60s, kind of with these dissonant collage-like elements, it's the same kind of distribution of forms and images across the canvas. But there's something else. And I said, is there, is there a play going on between good and evil? Between, is there something about redemption? Um, uh, and, and Roger said, well, you know, in a way, they're like medieval morality plays. And all of this, these cast of characters, the fox, the, the crows, the uh, different, you know, um, the fires, those were all a part of my daily existence. I would see foxes jumping up in the air on the right, right in front of their, our acreage and they would, diving. They would be leaping and their nose would go down in the snow and they would come back up with three mice in their mouth. <laughs> and it was a way of hunting. Um, it, it looked like something else uh, symbolically. So there, there, you know, there's, there's a reason for this. There is something going on about predator and prey. So you have here with landscape with sun and moon, you have a dead deer on the snow with blood trickling out of its mouth. You've got a black dog chained to the side, an angel uh, traversing the sky uh, following a crow, and another crow watching all of this taking place in Bucksport, Maine. So, uh, by the Penobscot River. Um, so there's something, and, and the other thing, just as an aside, when you wonder, well, where do, where do all of these, angel, these images come from? Well, uh, Roger and Jeanette were on a, a, a trip in West Texas. They saw a dead deer in the road. Uh, Roger bent down and took a photo of it, and also tried to match, this is how far artists, goes, artists will go for authenticity tried to match the blood color by pricking his own finger and um, making sure that that hue held, held, it, held it in the snow. That's true. I knew blood was red, but beyond that, you know, <laughs> uh, ask Sherwin Williams, they have probably seven or 8,000 reds, and which red is blood? And I know it sounds horrible, and it was, but... Um, my finger was the nearest blood <laughs> I could find, and I did sort of get a little sample of it and put it on white paper and um, match it <laughs> in color. Uh, in order to keep painting, to keep moving forward, uh, Roger would drive from Maine back to Texas um, and try to go back to his roots, and especially South Texas. Um, and he did this series, Texas Odyssey, and again, this, that combination of magic realism, surrealism, and, um, and, and the other thing that's important, we have to remember that Roger grew up not 18 feet from the railroad tracks, all right? That was in his line of vision for the first uh, 17 years of his life and the passenger trains go passing and coming and passing and wondering what else was out there. So that horizontal line is going to be kind of a through line uh, for his entire career. And so here we have this woman, of course, doing this endless task of sweeping the highway as a locomotive comes barreling forward. Do we have time? I, there was another short thing I wanted to read. Okay, go ahead. And this is from the book about collage and, and assemblage, about uh, my work. I wrote something about each person, and I wrote less about me just being, a, you know, a selfless, 
egomaniac. <laughs> the composer Ned Roram once told me that art cannot be abstract, nor can music be concrete. It's beyond me to know whether or not his pronouncement is accurate, but my view of painting has always been that it is either objective or subjective, or a combination of the two. The words abstract and concrete have never occurred to me while painting. Early on, I worked directly from life with an occasional foray into a made-up figurative subject. When, step by painful step, I discovered collage, I began painting details from snapshots interacting with made-up geometric backgrounds. This way of painting causes one to look inside oneself to invent the related placement of realistic images in unrealistic scales, to flatten background areas so space is seen only through the push and pull of color or through overlapping planes. This approach used and uses, because I still do that now and then, more of me than painting directly from life. But to balance and incorporate memory, twilight sleep, dreams, etc., into an invented space of color and, and form is difficult and sometimes emotionally painful work. Yet it continues to resonate for me like no other work I've produced. I want to say that uh, uh, Roger and Jeanette moved to Pipe Creek outside of Bandera. Uh, and at the same time, they lived there uh, for, for many months out of the year, but you were also going back and forth to New York. And again, remember, Roger is always searching, always pushing. And at one point, he was in New York City and looked around and said, well, everything's like a still life. Let me interject one, mm -hmm. one quote. Picasso is to have said, the natural movement of the soul is forward. And I've always seen that as a So here we have these uh, glass reflections. And again, the, the control and the visionary power, but to keep everything uh, 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 correct and, and clarified and straight and uh, looking at people on the streets, our daily passage with one another. Uh, Roger has also uh, taken different directions in sculpture. Here's a crouching rabbit an insect emerging from a flower. That rabbit is what Lyndon Johnson would have called a hunkered down rabbit. That's <laughs> well, look what, at that rabbit That's what he time. once referred to Richard Nixon as. <laughs> but also to, to he's, he's been on an onward quest to pare down and simplify. Um, uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, around 2008, Roger and Jeanette um, m bought a house in Santa Fe and became very attuned to the spirituality of New Mexico and the indigenous uh, people, but also uh, the light and um, uh, just the, 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 uh, the spirituality, the, this is Christmas Day, the cemeteries, but again, you can see his use of fire um, uh, and, and the, the, the feeling of solitariness and aloneness uh, at the same time, he's been doing commission portraits. This is Brit, and it's just full of life and spirit. And the other thing with Roger, he's always been fascinated by faces and our daily passage with one another. He's, he's kind of shy, although you wouldn't know it today, but uh, he loves people. And I think that comes from being a little boy and going through boxes and boxes of family photos and treasuring them and, and looking at people. I drew from the faces of uh, people, I ne relatives I didn't even know when I was preschool age. Um, and here's Jeanette, and again, uh, uh, using paint as form and structure. Another portrait, Jay Murray. Um, Roger's style changed again. Uh, after uh, going to uh, Iceland, after five trips, uh, it really changed his life in terms of reducing and simplifying. And that's and Greenland, moving, 
that painting is Greenland. Greenland, right. And moving towards a more simplified style. Um, it's also something about our mortality and the fragility of this earth. Uh, Roger said when they went to Greenland, um, uh, one woman told him that they used to be afraid of water, of ice, and now they're afraid of water with the changing climate and the melting of the glaciers. So you can see this uh, reductive vision and completely um, uh, about luminosity. And coming back to New York, uh, living in New York and um, uh, uh, becoming a more precisionist style as he was moving back and forth and these trips to Iceland and looking at the glaciers and the light and the banding and razor sharp horizon lines. This is top of a glacier. Roger, do you want to comment on well, any of this and where your style was going? I brought one more thing to read, and then I won't read you <laughs> anything else. But writing is so um, condensed and incisive, and and I'm a, my mind wanders at this age if I just talk. I had to write this artist statement for for something, and I wanted to read it to you. And it's about this recent work. I open it with a. Um, quote from St. Bernard of Clairvaux. What is God? He is length, width, height, and depth. And then I wrote, in his later years, Romare Bearden was more concerned with what he could leave out of his work than what to include. Or so I was told by his friend and caretaker, Russell Goings. Perhaps with the decline of physical strength and the weakening eyesight of aging, most visual artists feel a similar need to reduce, to simplify. And I, I wrote that last July, and I said I will be 84 in a few days. Well, I'll be 85 in a few days now. <laughs> Time flies, whatever you're doing. Um, and for years I have felt this need to simplify. Having a view of the Hudson River and the New Jersey coast at my studio windows has helped. Living part-time in New Mexico with its high desert plains, vast sky, and sparse vegetation nourished my need, but nothing else has been as influential as the five trips I've made along the Ring Road in Iceland. The visible world there is reduced to long stretches of sky, water, and black lava beaches or the field of vision will be no more than the top of a glacier under a cloudless blue sky. But I'm only a visitor in Iceland, despite its influence on my work, and I no longer live in New Mexico. New York City is now my home. In the past, I have painted New York City from several viewpoints, from the interaction of people and buildings and statues and Union Square to window displays and subway riders, but in this time in life, I'm far more interested in the city's geometry, whether in the heavy beams at a building site or the steps leading down to a brownstone basement or the doors and windows of the cliff dwellings where we all live and work or the sidewalks and rooftops of horizontal planes. I live, I live in a geometric world. And this constantly evolving world is what I paint. Nothing in this state on, whoops, nothing in this world is static. Depending on the weather or whatever book I might be reading or my physical state on a given day or the restless growth of the city, I'm in a slightly changed context from week to week. I think of the geometric spaces and their constant change as well as my constant change as the sources of my paintings at this time. And I want to say that um, it, it's also important to remember, again, Roger never loses touch with the surface. These aren't flatly painted. No, every not. little pat, every little brush stroke, and it catches the light and shimmers as you stand in front of it. Um, and I also want to say these are all the last images that we've shown are all recent paintings. He is painting every single day. And just as we get older and our days lessen in number, Roger is getting to the essence of our existence and who we are. And he reminds us over and over 
what it means to live a life richly, but also to make art for its own sake out of inner vision and necessity. So I think we're going to wrap that up. And if you have anything else to say, I. I think we've said too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Roger, you mentioned one relationship with the gallery that maybe was good and then didn't go so good. So I don't know, you've been represented by I don't know how many galleries through your career, but I'll be interested in other, in just another feedback you have on that experience. Well, um, a lot of dealers have criticized me because I've changed galleries so often, but I think that's based on a lack of business sense. You know, if I get <laughs> tired of one thing, I go to another, th you know, I just... And I think it has something to do, they didn't know how to market you. Well, you that's know, because true, too. You, he, as like, you can see, he was changing, he's growing. Galleries have liked, oh, most galleries, Kirk Hopper is certainly an exception to that, but most galleries like to have artists with signature styles that they can depend on because art is a, a commercial object to them. To me, oh sorry, to me it's not really a commercial object, it's, it's all that I do, it's what I do. And it takes, it's, it's a circuitous path. <laughs> and to, to just, um, another, another quote of Picasso's was he said, uh, it's more dangerous for an artist to imitate himself than it is to imitate others. <laughs> And you can think about that, but I think that's a, a, a very good idea. But just doing the same thing over and over is something I was not made to do. And I, I'm, I'm always looking for something. Albert Pinkham Ryder once said he felt like he was out on the end of a limb in a tree, reaching for the next space. And that's precisely the way I feel also. That brought a tear. <laughs> but old men cry easily. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Any other questions? I know you can't, but I'd be willing to stay here all day. <laughs> Yes. I wanted to actually go back to the painting of yourself and the other um, artists, uh, most working in Texas, uh, the work that was shown at the Dallas Contemporary and show that was uh, One eye at a time. Mm -hmm. oh, the montage. That, the montage mm -hmm. one yes, eye I could, but I couldn't understand the question. What, I'm, how did you know those Dallas artists and maybe Helen Douglas McCagney you know those artists? We worked. Oh, we worked together at the Dallas Museum of Contemporary Art and we, we became social friends. We were sort of a group. And uh, there was those people that I painted. Hal, I didn't mention Hal Polly, who was also in that montage. He had been the head of the, work, the installation group at the Contemporary Museum. I've said this before, but Douglas McAggie, the director of the museum, was like the sun to us, and we were these little satellites revolving around McAggie. He was very sophisticated. He knew a great deal more about art and the world than we knew, and he, he gifted it to us very generously. Oh, that was, that was well said. Yeah. It was really nice. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.